imagine, imagine a journey into the parlor of famed investigative reporter Rob Simone. Imagine the scotch has been flowing, and he is talking with government insider Gordon Novell. Imagine what we might learn if we could sit in. Imagine. Well, I want to welcome everybody to another edition of Disclosure Dialogue here at the Laughlin Congress in 2009. Now, some of you were here last year where we brought on Dan Bursch, Area 51 scientist, who has never really come forward before. And he stood here and explained his remarkable story that had to do with Area 51, live EBEs, and of course, Majestic 12. Well, we are carrying on this fine tradition with Gordon Novell, someone who has had a front row seat to history and has even participated in more ways than one. He's an infamous person with a very large personality and a very large body of knowledge at his disposal. And we're going to continue this discussion of MJ-12, along with his insider knowledge about alien technology and what the government knows and what they have at their possession, who pulls the strings, and what's possible to take this technology forward and perhaps end our dependence on natural gas and oil. Please welcome to the stage Gordon Novell. Gordon, thanks for being here. You're welcome. Uh, this, I'm sure, for you is a change of pace. A bit. Does it feel like you've been dragged out of the shadows? Yeah, well, I got a cold that kind of drug me into the shadows. <laughs> you are someone who is infamous. Good and bad, you have been part of history. I, I don't go with the infamous. I would rather go with the semi-famous. <laughs> well, I think it's fair to begin where history finds you, and that's back in the 70s and 80s, you were involved in the uh, JFK assassination to the degree that one of the prosecutors was trying to find you to uh, serve a subpoena on you. Can you take us back to that time? Well, I was his chief of security, so I kind of dumped on him with the uh, NBC with a lie detector test that said he was faking the whole thing. So, I mean, he had reason to be mad. Who's he? Jim Garrison. Jim Garrison. Yeah, I was your arch enemy at that time. Yeah. And yeah. you were not particularly interested, I guess, in, in talking to him. No, I, uh, I, I, it wasn't a matter of talking. It was the matter that if I said anything, I was going to either be held in contempt for not saying it or I was going to be charged with perjury for saying. So you couldn't win. It was catch-22. So mm -hmm. I just decided I would avoid him. So you fled to Ohio. I didn't flee. I went up to pick up an engagement ring from my former wife. Okay. That was what the, there was no fleeing at all okay. involved, and it just happened that he decided to send me a subpoena while I was in Ohio. Still, not a bad, not a bad strategy. No one ever think to look in Ohio. Well, <laughs> thank God I, I, I befriended the governor, and so I didn't have a problem. Not too bad, not too bad. Well, you, of course, uh, have been sort of linked into uh, uh, this uh, cover-up, too, of, of the JFK assassination. Is that fair? Well, I, I, you know, I've got to kind of disagree with you about this because I don't think you've got the proper perspective. At Set the record time, straight. Yeah. At that time, I was working uh, both for Garrison overtly and covertly. I was working for the White House and the Attorney General of the United States, Ramsey Clark, who's one of my best friends. And uh, we knew that Garrison, uh, we had a pretty good idea that there was assassination conspiracy, but it wasn't the one he was playing with. And the resentfulness was that he was trying to frame the CIA and avoid his frame uh, or you know, avoid his um, putting any of his uh, spotlight on the mafia because he was too friendly with them. And, um, so we, uh, we took some umbrage at that, and they asked me if I could uh, un unhorse him. And uh, I'd been working at the White House on another project when all that happened. And mm -hmm. 
it just happened. But uh, when you say you were working with Garrison, in what capacity? Is it I was his chief of security. Chief of security. Yeah. And so, what other duties did that entail? Making sure his phones weren't bugged yeah. and um, keeping basically a good eye on him to make sure that the people who were walking in and out of the office weren't tape recorded or yeah. that somebody wasn't trying to set him up, et cetera, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But did you foil any plots? No, the only plot I foil was his plots to frame the people he was trying to do because he was he was faking letters off the typewriters he seized in evidence and he would write letters and, and, and photocopy signatures using the Xerox machine because people didn't realize how easy it was to do. So mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it was um, it was uh, mostly uh, the the plot I was trying to foil was his plot to frame the government. So how did you come across the information that ran contrary to his theory? The trash basket. The what? The trash basket. When he, when he would get finished with his work, he'd take his work products, whatever it was, and throw it in the trash can. So I got the, 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 the privilege of shredding the, the, the trash, mm -hmm. and I didn't shred it. Oldest trick in the book. Yeah. <laughs> well, so what did you discover in this in the uh, the round file, as they call it. Oh, I, I got a letter where he had typed a letter uh, on Clay Shaw's typewriter that he had seized in a, in a, in a, with a subpoena, and then he typed a letter from Shaw to Oswald, and then put Shaw's Lee Harvey Oswald. Yeah, yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. And what was so, what was the contents of that? Do you recall? Oh, I don't even remember. It was mm -hmm. something about you know, would you would, would you like to have a cup of coffee or something? It wasn't anything other than the fact that they that it would have mm -hmm. implied that they knew each other. Mm -hmm. and, that was what he wanted. That was his conspiracy link. So. Mm -hmm. um, but let me repeat again, I was working for the Attorney General. Right. And so you mentioned I, I didn't that. talk about that for years and years and years and until, until uh, 1993. I didn't say anything about it. There was no need to say anything about it. What, what happened in 93 that changed that? I went to work for Ramsey as chief investigator on the Waco case. On the Waco case? Yeah. Okay. yeah. Everything you saw in the 90s about the Waco case, and the burning and the machine gunning and right. all those terrible things that the government did to those fine folks, they, uh, they came out of my shop, including the movie. You were, uh, yeah, I mean, you shed some light on that through your investigation and your, uh, uh, your examination of the FLIR, the night footage. Yeah, yeah, the, I discovered that. And, uh, when you say that, tell, tell, the, tell what, what... Well, it was a, a tape that the FBI had taken from an airplane above the compound, and it was a FLIR, forward-looking infrared, and he, uh, a lot of people looked at the tape, but they didn't look at it carefully, and when I looked at it, I saw these little flashes, and then when I blew them up, I saw that they were machine gun flashes, and we could count the cyclic rate and tie it to the weapon that they were using. And, they were just shooting the hell out of the people when they were trying to get out of the fire, mm -hmm. women and children. Mm. So uh, when I exposed that, that ended up in a movie called Waco, The Rules of Engagement. It got an Academy Award nomination. So it was, it was a good investigation. It, was, uh, it lasted for about seven years. We went to the Supremes. We couldn't win. And we had them as dead as dead gets. I mean, it was an open and shut case of mass murder. Mm -hmm. but, uh, the court system is, uh, the federal court system, they appoint these judges for life and they're beholden to the people who appoint them, which is the government of the United States. Mm. So you well, don't get any justice when you go after the FBI for 82 counts of murder one. Mm -hmm. Well, going back uh, to this very uh, interesting period in your life, you mentioned uh, you were involved in making sure the, the office or, or he wasn't bugged. You, you have some pretty interesting... Um, experience and in, in countermeasures when it comes to uh, listening devices? Yeah, I got, uh, I, I, I originally developed a countermeasure system for the White House that they termed checkmate and it would make it impossible for anybody to use a tape recorder or a radio transmitter or laser beams on the window and that kind of thing. It set up a magnetic field screen that uh, you couldn't hear it or see it or any of that, but it, the microphones all picked it up. So mm. it, was a, it was quite an invention. It stayed in the White House's number one secrecy because they wouldn't turn it on unless they were going to talk nuclear war. Mm 